Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio and our summer series, Ten of a Thousand Voices. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, those of us who've listened to old-time radio have marveled at the vocal versatility of many actors who could play a variety of roles and do many different voices. But there were two actors who starred in programs where they played all the voices without any assistance at all. Each was known as the Man of a Thousand Voices or the One Man Theater. And this summer series is going to focus on these versatile performances. We'll be playing episodes from a total of four series and alternating between each men. We'll be going for 13 weeks. In seven weeks, we'll feature programs starring Bay Star Paul Freeze. And each program is going to be about 15 minutes. So this is kind of an exciting little experiment for me because I've, I've toyed with the idea of doing something self-contained 15-minute old-time radio programs, and this will give me a chance to try this out. Now, Mr. Free's work in this regard appeared in two series known as The Player and Studio X. I have to be honest that I don't know why there were two different series. Uh, there seemed to be a number of stories which are the same performance. But one was released as Studio X, and then they, you know, then there's another version version of it released as the player. Both uh, productions were made by Capitol Records Syndication. The main difference is, uh, that's apparent is that both have different announcers, so whether one was recorded first and then they switched to the other, I can't say. But today's program is going to be an episode of Studio X, and this is listed by Radio Gold Index as program number two in the series with the title Frozen Justice. John Mason was a little man. Everything about him fairly shrieked meekness and mildness, but on this particular morning, as John stared at the ledges spread out on the desk before him, he knew he'd have to acquire courage and power of will. For on this particular morning, John Mason was faced with an unavoidable situation. He knew he must kill a man. And that's the dramatic opening to another story from Studio X. Starring America's most versatile actor, Mr. Paul Fries, who will return after a few profitable moments with your announcer. your star of Studio X, Mr. Paul Fries. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Studio X and our presentation of Frozen Justice. John Mason pushed his work away from him with an impatient gesture and leaned back in his chair. It was useless to try to concentrate on figures with the sting of his daughter's scornful tone still ringing in his ears. 
He closed his eyes, but he couldn't shut out of his mind his daughter Mary's face as she had looked across the desk a few moments before. She had poured out the story of how Big Ben Nelson was out to get Bob Stewart. Her Bob. The man she was going to marry. Because Bob, in the line of duty, had to report Big Ben for incompetence, costing the great hulk of a man his job. John knew that at any time, Bob's path would have to cross that of Big Ben, and there would be serious trouble. For Bob was big and strong also, and when two giants meet in mortal combat, certainly injury and maybe even death would result. Then Bob would either be dead or in jail. All he could think of was that Mary's future depended on the well-being of Bob Stewart and that somehow he, John Mason... And then suddenly a plan flashed into his feverish brain. A silly, improbable, impossible plan. He put on his plain black overcoat, adjusted his earmuffs under his hat, and walked out into the sub-zero cold and headed down the town's main street toward the Silver Dollar Saloon. You know what I'm going to do to that skunk of a Bob Stewart? I'm going to take him by the neck with these two hands, and I'm going to squeeze a living daylights out of him. You talk mighty loud, Ben, but I got it figured out that you're just a big bag of wind. John began to peel off a glove as he continued. Yep, talk's mighty cheap, but personally, I think you're nothing but a big bully, and I'm aiming to prove it to everybody in this town. By now, the little man's glove was off, and with a lightning gesture, he whipped it across the tall man's face. Runt! Why? Why, you little runt? I'll break every bone in your body. Sure. Sure, I know I ain't no match for you physically, but there's other ways of deciding things. That's why I slapped you with my glove. If you weren't so goddamn ignorant, you'd know that I was a challenging you to a duel. <laughs> a duel, he says. A duel with what? With water pistols or cream puffs? <laughs> a duel with rifles. At 30 paces, tomorrow morning at 7, out at the edge of town by the sawmill. Each man to bring his own rifle. Why, well, you kidding, runt? Well, you'll find out tomorrow morning, because either you'll be there or the whole town will know you're a coward like I do. All right, don't worry, little man, I'll be there. Now, scat! Well, my, uh, house is on your way out to the sawmill. Suppose you stop by and take me with you, just to be sure that I'm there, Big Ben. There, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll be by at 6.30, just to be sure that you're there. News travels like wildfire in a small mining town. So when John reached home for supper that night, he found Mary in tears and Bob trying to assure her that he would see that nothing happened to her father. They stormed at little John for getting himself into such a dire predicament. But to all their protestations, John kept repeating over and over. I've got a plan, I tell you, I've got a plan. He wouldn't divulge that plan, however. Not even when Bob reminded him. Look, Mr. Mason, everybody knows that Big Ben is a crack shot, especially with a rifle. Well, I've seen him myself pick off a rabbit on the run, and with a rifle, that's pretty good shooting. Look, why don't you let me go down and meet Ben now? Maybe we'll muss each other up a little, but he won't be in any shape to fight a duel with you in the morning. No, sir. Don't you dare do that, Bob. I've got to live the rest of my life in this town, and people have enough contempt for me now. Why, I wouldn't dare show my face in the street if they thought I hid and let you do my fighting for me. And anyway, you don't have to worry. <laughs> I've got a plan, I tell you. I've got a plan, and, I, and I've got a good one. John Mason didn't sleep much that night. He wasn't frightened. He was amazed at this cold detachment as he went over and over the events as they would probably happen on the morrow. Mary never closed her eyes throughout the long night, and at 5.30 she could stay in bed no longer. Putting on her clothes, she went out into the kitchen, started a roaring fire in the range, and put on a big pot of coffee to boil. Some moments later, her father joined her, dressed as neatly as though he were going to the office, and with no sign of fear or worry on his face. Oh, have I got an appetite. Uh, how about cooking up a big bowl of cereal for me, daughter? Yes, sir, there's nothing like good hot cereal to start the day. Mary turned duly toward the shelf containing the pots and pans, grateful for any task which would keep her thoughts occupied. The cooking cereal shot up clouds of steam which filled the kitchen with aroma and caused a film of ice to coat the glass in the kitchen window. When the food was placed before him, John ate even more deliberately than usual. Mary couldn't even pretend to eat. 
Her eyes turned again and again to the big clock on the kitchen wall. The hands seemed to be racing, the big one trying desperately to catch up with the little one, both moving steadily toward the number six. Mary was staring at them when they said 628, and at that moment there was a banging on the outer door. Well, I guess that's Big Ben now, Mary. You go let him in, will you, dear? Tell him to come in here to the kitchen and have a cup of coffee. He'll be cold enough to appreciate it, and besides, I'm not quite finished with my breakfast yet. Mary could only stare at him in amazement, but she went to do his bidding. In a moment, Big Ben stomped into the kitchen, his big hunting rifle under his arm, and little John greeted him. Well, come in, Ben. Come in, warm your hands, set down your gun, and have a cup of coffee, eh? All right, Mason. Never mind the gab. Let's get going and get this over with. Why, surely you wouldn't deprive me of my breakfast. Why, even condemned men get to eat their last meal in peace, don't they? <laughs> the little man continued to eat deliberately. And his daughter Mary realized that he was fighting for time for the few more precious minutes which would undoubtedly be his last. Finally, he wiped his mouth carefully with his napkin, pushed back his chair and arose. Well, well, I'm ready now. He picked up his rifle beside the door. All right, Ben, let's go. Bob Stewart realized that he must not interfere with the duel, but he also knew that he would be on the spot and that if anything happened to John, he would step in and try to finish the big job himself. When he arrived at the stretch of level pasture beside the sawmill at the edge of town, he found a huge crowd of miners already assembled. Doc Summers stepped forward a few paces to meet them. Doc was to act as referee of the shooting match and also in his professional capacity as soon as one or both of the men required it. There were few preliminaries. Then they took their places. Little John looking ludicrous with the back of his head touching Big Ben's shoulder blades. There was a deathly hush as Doc's voice cut the icy air. One, two, three. The two men began to walk, Big Ben with quick, nervous strides, Little John slowly and deliberately as if they were trying to give his opponent the advantage, as indeed he did. Big Ben whirled after his 15th step, flung his rifle to his shoulder and waited. John was still walking. Now he had stopped and turned about, his rifle still unraised. Bob could see Big Ben's knuckles whiten as he squeezed the trigger. Strange, he thought, that Big Ben should squeeze it with so much force, and yet there was still no sound from the gun. The rifle had jammed. Big Ben's face showed his panic. Frantically, he touched at the action of his gun, but it wouldn't budge. Meanwhile, John Mason had sunk slowly to one knee. He brought his own rifle to his shoulder and took deliberate aim. Big Ben gazed horrified across the shrinking space that separated him from death. And in one brief instant, his nerve broke. Don't! Don't kill me, Mason! Don't shoot me like a dog! All right, Ben. I won't shoot you like a dog. I'll give you the same chance I would give a rabbit. All right, start running, and when I count to 20, I'll start trying to pick you off. Big Ben turned and fled. Little John didn't bother to count to 20. He didn't fire a single shot at the retreating bully. He knew that Big Ben Nelson would never be seen around these parts again. Bob Stewart rushed up to John and flung an arm around his sparse, lean shoulders. Tell me, was Ben's gun jamming an act of providence, or was that a part of that plan you were so smug about? Well, son, I'll give you a tip. You know... When you bring a cold rifle into a warm room in which there's plenty of steam, a lot of moisture forms on the steel, especially around all the little parts of the firing mechanism. And then when you come back outside into the zero weather like this, why, that water freezes as hard as steel. And so ends another story from Studio X. Starring your one-man theater, Paul Fries, who portrays all of the parts. Mr. Fries will return in just a moment after a few words from your announcer.
Frozen Justice was written by John Boylan, produced by Sam Kerner with music composed and played by Rami Idris. Special effects by Fred Cole. Your announcer was Shepard Mencken. Won't you join us again at Studio X when we present another thrilling story for your entertainment. This is Paul Fries saying goodbye. Until next, we meet. Welcome back. Well, a very uh, solid uh, performance by Mr. Freeze. Whether the solution with tricking our bully into bringing his uh, rifle indoors uh, works, I'll leave to the firearms experts in the audience. Freeze did a great job making all these characters really distinct. And I guess brought home the point that it really was not necessary to kill the bully, just to kill his reputation. One thing of note is that Freeze didn't give a voice to Mary. And I do kind of wonder whether uh, we'll see any attempt at doing women's voices at all in this series. It can be a kind of a tough thing to do in a way that comes across believable. Now, we should talk a little bit about Paul Freese and his career. And Paul Freese uh, simply is a voice acting legend. He did a lot of work with Disney, uh, his character of Ludwig Von Drake, and also uh, provides a voice for several attractions at Disney theme park. And then there's the his work in the J. Ward Productions series. He was Boris Badenov on The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle, as well as Inspector Fenwick. Fred from Super Chicken, uh, he uh, added voices to the uh, Frosty the Snowman uh, specials from Rankin Bass, and also narrated and voiced so many television shows and movies. It's just an incredible legacy. It's been part of generations of people's childhoods, and his work just goes on and on. So we're really pleased to uh, feature it in uh, this a series of the Men of a Thousand Voices. Next week, we turn to Frank Graham, who had the first series as a one-man theater. Although he's less remembered, but we'll talk more about Mr. Graham's life and legacy, as well as some other storytellers and Men of a Thousand Voices next week's program. In the meantime, if you do have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.